So now, without further ado, I'm pleased to present Dr. Ulrich. Hello. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. George Ulrich. I'm an uh, ophthalmologist. I've been a practicing ophthalmologist for 17 years, and uh, I've worked very extensively in a clinical setting, so I know what it's like to see patients. I know what it's like to make diagnoses, work with patients on making decisions about surgery or treatment. I have uh, some additional training in glaucoma, and uh, so I know what it's like to follow patients over a period of time and to scratch your head at times about what's the best thing to do in terms of decision making. So I want to talk today about Spectralis as a product of Heidelberg Engineering and First of all, spectralis is a, a spectrum of the device. It can be configured in several different ways, and the ways that I find useful in comprehensive ophthalmology is it has the ability to do multimodality imaging. So it's really best, rather than to just call it OCT, it's really multimodality imaging. It allows you to look at the retina using infrared, so you get a nice black and white IR picture, IR standing for infrared. You also get OCT cross-sections, and the third feature is an autofluorescence feature that allows you to see uh, aspects of the deeper layers, specifically the uh, Brooks membrane area and the uh, involved areas of retinal pigment epithelium, which are re really quite helpful in uh, discerning why someone may have subnormal vision. So overall, it assists you very much in diagnosis, and we all know that anything that can add to your clinic efficiency, keep you on time, help you cut to the chase, is a, a very helpful tool, so it works in that way. It's also helpful in following patients over time. As, uh, as I'll mention, it has a very exquisite ability to identify the retina very specifically anatomically and in follow-up examinations to look at the exact same area in the exact same way so that you can see what changes may have taken place either for the better or for the worse. And because we have visual images that are projected on a high-resolution computer screen, it's very helpful in instruction, instructing patients about their condition. The patient can actually see what an optic nerve is if you're talking to them about something that's so vague as glaucoma, where they can see what macular edema looks like and they can actually see how much thickness the retina may have and over time uh, their improvement. So it's very visual and it's very helpful for getting patients involved and I think it's very helpful for compliance. Uh, also should point out because it's a modality that we use, uh, it's billable for Medicare and private insurance. So this is an image of a healthy eye, to give an example. And you can see that there is, on the left, an infrared image. And the green line through there is the cross-section. And the cross-section appears over here on the right. And you can see how definitely highly resolved the uh, appearance of the retina is as, as displayed here. So it's an impressive amount of, of uh, of detail that can be seen. This is just a labeled view of ultra-high resolution that's obtained with spectralis. And you can actually see the external limiting membrane, the internal limiting membrane. The segment that is very interesting here, you can see the nerve fiber layer, the thickness is very discreet. And that's very nice uh, and can be shown in so many different ways to help you with a diagnosis. So to show that you can take a line segment in any orientation, this happens to be a segment that goes through the optic nerve head, and you can see that in cross-section, and then it traverses through the macula, and it shows some of the normal features of the macula. This is the mode of scanning when you're studying a patient with glaucoma or suspected glaucoma. There's actually a slice taking taken around the optic nerve, which we're familiar with in looking at the nerve fiber layer. And then that is displayed in a left to right sequence in what we've always called a T-SNIT graph. That is, you know, the temporal, superior, nasal, and inferior. And as expected in a patient with a healthy optic nerve, you have 
uh, thicker areas superiorly and inferiorly, which is, is what we expect to see. But this is directly obtained from spectralis. Just as an example, to give you an overall view, here's a patient who, in the bottom uh, slide, you can see that the inferior optic nerve, the, the inferior layer of the nerve fiber layer is depleted as compared to healthy patients. You might expect this patient to have a superior visual field defect. And I'd also point out that the one of the utilities of this instrument is you can take this picture and in over time you might examine this patient six months up the road and notice if there has been any change in the thickness of the nerve fiber layer, which can verify whether your treatment is adequate or whether you may need to step up treatment and lower the pressure further in order to halt progression. I'll just talk about the spectralis unit. And one of the very unique features is it has a eye, an eye tracking system. So there are two beams. One of the beams is the scanning laser, infrared. It's not really a laser. It's a light in the, uh, in the wavelength of uh, about 820 nanometers. And that recognizes the features of the retina and locks on to those features. So if the patient's eye moves during the examination, the laser that is imaging it, that is both the imaging laser and the OCT beam, follows the eye very, very distinctly just as the eye moves. And what it does is it allows an extremely precise capture of the image. And it allows exams that are repeated to be repeated in exactly the same location so that you can be sure that you're comparing apples to apples from one exam to the next. So this registration between consecutive images allows for exact comparison to the patient's baseline, which is really helpful, as we know, in many eye diseases. So I'm going to go through an example of some commonly encountered problems that you might encounter. You know, this might be a typical day or half day or part of a day in your clinic. Things you see and how spectralis can be useful as a multimodality imaging tool to help you deal with patient problems and help you make decisions. Uh, conditions might, consi might consist of, uh, an example, patients who are not seeing as well as expected. Uh, you might suspect maculopathy, could be macular hole, could be vitreomacular traction, could be CME, could be A and B. We all know that um, some means of seeing these things, it's difficult sometimes to visualize vi uh, clinically and that angiography can be helpful. But I'm going to point out the strength of OCT and in many cases the strength of autofluorescence so that you don't actually have to have a full-on uh, angiography suite to uh, observe and make these diagnoses all the time. It's also helpful for patients who are considering uh, whether they're going to have a premium uh, multifocal lens implanted. That is very helpful because these patients often have a higher expert expectation of the visual outcome and you certainly don't want to implant these devices if someone has a degree of a macular dysfunction. And these are patients who have cataracts, so you might have trouble seeing some of the subtle problems that might be there in the macula. And it's not a good thing to find these things after surgery and find that the patient has a suboptimal visual result and they've gone to the trouble and expense of paying for um, a multifocal IOL or a refractive IOL. And then finally, encountering glaucoma, which, which uh, as we all know in clinical practice, and comprehensive practice happens a lot. So let me just uh, present a few cases. This is a case that's a 70-year-old woman. She's pseudophagic, and she re has a complaint of reduced clarity of vision. Well, that's a pretty common thing, and that she's noticed some slow progressive change. Now, she's pseudophagic, and the considerations are, well, is she in the correct glasses? Has something changed? Uh, and in, in addressing that with refraction, um, she doesn't quite, you know, get which is better, one or two. It's hard for her to find the end point. And uh, her tear film on slit lamp exam looks healthy, so we might then next consider could she have a posterior capsule opacity. 
And in this patient, she had a very slight opacity in the right eye and an open capsule in the left eye from a previous YAG. So she still had a best corrected acuity with the open capsule of 2030 in that left eye, the best corrected acuity of 2040. So why isn't she seeing 2020? Well, there's uh, ability to take a look at the retina in detail using the multimodality imaging. So we've considered the media, we've considered the tear film, so we'll, we'll now apply the spectralis. Uh, as I mentioned, the eye tracking and, and autofluorescence is going to allow us to learn a lot about this patient, and the resolution is going to leave us with a really distinct impression of what's going on without having to be scratching our heads and going, oh, well, maybe it's just not a good day for this lady. So the image is obtained, uh, patients in a device, you know, very similar to what they're used to in a slit lamp. A technician performs the examination and captures the image, very easy to do. And in this patient, what we notice is the infrared image, which looks similar to the clinic, clinic image. So it's kind of giving you an impression that hmm, maybe there's some RPE disturbance. And in sh sure enough, uh, images like this, you can obtain those when you're looking at a patient uh, through the slit lamp with a 90 or 78 diopter lens. A lot of times they're moving around a little bit, so you don't get a long, good, hard look. But the infrared image of the spectralis gives you a really nice picture, and you can see, boy, there's RPE trouble there, perhaps. But when we apply the other mode of imaging, which is the autofluorescence, now we can see it's even more extensive than what it looks like clinically. You can see with this uh, blue peak autofluorescence, FAF stands for fluorescein, uh, I'm sorry, which stands for fundus autofluorescence. There's no fluorescein involved at all. Uh, it shows the, the hyperfluorescence, or the or it shows the autofluorescence where there is a, a lack of retinal pigment epithelium. Just to show a correlation, this is what it would look like in angiography. So we don't need to apply angiography here in order to see that this patient in the right eye has an extensive um, amount of RPE dropout, and that explains why they're not 20-20. And that patient can look at this picture and learn what the nature of their problem is. Uh, we just add in the left eye of this patient, again, there's a little bit more, more diffuse dropout, sometimes in a blonde fundus. This is difficult to see, but when you apply the blue peak autofluorescence, you can really see a very predominant amount of pathology there that explains why 2030 minus and not 2020. It explains why a patient's slow in the foreopter. And this happens to be correlating angiography, although not every spectralis unit has to be configured with angiography. Uh, but this shows as very much that you can see quite a bit of the pathology just with autofluorescence mode. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about another patient that's common. This is a 68-year-old patient, and is complaining that has had painless progressive loss of vision. So you're getting what I'm getting is this is probably going to be a cataract. In fact, the patient does have cataract. And desires cataract surgery, wants to see better, is having trouble doing some things that uh, require good acuity, um, has the appropriate complaints. And uh, in discussing this with the patient, um, in discussing the options, the patient is considering whether she might want to have a multifocal intraocular lens implanted, of course, at her expense. And again, this does create expectations. The patient is going to pay a premium. Uh, they have an expectation they, they would have an outcome uh, that, that they get what they pay for. You certainly don't want to have a patient who has some macular problems. So this is where the assessment and counseling using uh, multimodality imaging can be very helpful. And this particular image here, I'll tell you the story. Um, the lady who is sitting to the left with the gray hair was, patient, was a, a patient of mine. This is before... Uh, spectralis was available, and she underwent cataract surgery and had elected to have a uh, multifocal IOL. And her vision was very good with the multifocal IOL. She just happened to mention that at night when she drove, she would see rings around headlights. She wasn't particularly 
complaining about it, just offering it as an observation. And we talked about it, and I talked, I had talked to her ahead of time, so she wasn't very, you know, distraught by any means about having it. She just mentioned it to me. Well, on my way to work, I happened to walk by these ladies. They have coffee every day at this table, and I said hello to my patient, and all the other ladies turned their heads at the same time and asked me, why did you do this surgery that gave her these halos around the headlight? So I want to point out that patients do talk to their friends, so whatever you do is going to be, uh, you know, passed around. And so the, the importance of a good patient outcome is good patient selection. In any case, this patient, um, when I looked in retrospect, she had also uh, a little bit of vitreomacular traction. It would have been nice to be able to see this because this is something that can be limiting in a post-operative eye. And you can see very nicely here that uh, when you look at the IR clinical image, it just looks like pretty much looks like a normal uh, fundus posterior pole. But with the OCT, and again, this is a black on white image that's part of the spectralis, very clearly, there's traction between the posterior vitreous face and the macula. This can limit vision. So this is something you want to know about before uh, embarking on surgery, especially if you're going to be uh, offering somebody the option of, of choosing a multifocal IOL. Uh, there's various degrees of this that you can see. This happens to be a different patient, but you could place the cursor and get a cross-section. Again, this doesn't look bad here particularly noticeable, but when you look in cross-section, you can see there's a lot of vitreomacular traction, even approaching hole formation. And this is the same image, just using the white on black format, but i just pointing out that you can switch with the mouse click, uh, either white on black or black on white sometimes to enhance things. Here's one that's advanced further, and this is, again, something that's clinically more observable, but when you look, you can see a nice correlation here, so this really helps you understand a patient who's having vitreal macular traction. And this is a nice example of a vitreous face that has become clear of the macula. So there's a space here, and there's no traction, and this patient just has a synoretic vitreous cavity here fluid filled and there's no traction on the macula. So you have no concerns and there's no danger that this patient would have vitreomacular traction. And a patient like this would expected to would be expected to have good vision with a posterior uh, implant and multifocal IOL. So that's a great use of spectralis in order to identify people who might be good candidates and certainly to exclude people who might not be satisfied candidates with that selection of, of uh, IOL. Let me just shift gears then, talk a little bit about glaucoma. Um, as we know, uh, the work with uh, Dr. Quigley, in, uh, as reported in the Archives of Ophthalmology, talks very much about how the structural loss, that is nerve fiber layer loss, precedes functional loss in glaucoma. And so the name of the game in glaucoma is being able to detect change early and that allows you to intervene early and prevent visual field loss. Because we estimate that by the time there's visual field loss, there's probably 50% loss of the nerve fiber layer. So it's very helpful to have a physical imaging modality, especially one that can be repeated. There are limitations as well to visual field testing. It requires a patient cooperation, whereas evaluating the anatomy is objective and spectralis will help us define the anatomy with that circle scan around the optic nerve head. So here's an example uh, where the circle scan around the optic nerve head shows that the superior area is preserved and there's a relative thinning inferiorly. So if this patient is diagnosed with glaucoma and is at a target pressure, that patient could be seen six months or a year hence, and this exam can be repeated. It'll be repeated in exactly the same place because of the eye tracking and registration, and the comparison of one point in time to another will be very exact 
so that you'll be able to have a fair amount of confidence that any change that you see is not related to patient performance. It's actually related to change in the nerve fiber layer. So the observation of change over time in the nerve fiber layer is very helpful. It requires eye tracking in order to get that high precision. Otherwise, you don't know exactly where the circle scan is, and you can't be sure you're comparing one segment to another. So eye tracking allows you to feel confident that you're actually comparing the same anatomy of the patient from one exam to the other. And it allows you to feel confident about decision making uh, and choosing intervention or additional intervention in order to um, maintain their optimal amount of visual field. Now, I put an asterisk next to my comment about patient instruction and compliance. That's because we all know how important it is to get the patient on board with treating glaucoma. They're going to be using an eye drop that stings for a disease that's very difficult for them to understand that they even have, especially in the earlier stages. So images that are created with OCT that really will display that nerve fiber layer and display what it means to lose nerve fiber layer will really help the patient understand why they are on medicine and it helps them understand why there's a benefit to being compliant. So the image and going over pictures with patients is just such a fast and efficient tool for getting them on as a member of your team, that is you and the patient, in optimally managing glaucoma. Let me now discuss another case, a typical patient. This patient not seeing as well as expected after cataract surgery and the suspicion of CME because that's one of the more common reasons for not seeing well several months after surgery as one might expect. Now the conventional modality for looking at CME is fluorescein angiography. And we all know too fluorescein angiography is is a, a very nice means of visualizing things, um, but it is somewhat expensive and it's certainly cumbersome. You have to have room in your clinic for it. You have to have a technician who's trained to do that. You're doing uh, intravenous uh, access, so you have to be able to deal with uh, sharps and you have to be able to deal with blood products. There's, there's just a, a host of practicalities that go on to having a fluorescein angiography suite. So alternatively, many bits of retina pathology can be seen using multimodality imaging and OCT, and these can quantify the amount of pathology, in this case edema, and again can be used to instruct a patient. So here's a good example of a patient who not seeing well, we did OCT scan, and the OCT certainly does show cystoid macular edema in the area of the macula. Um, I would also point out that one can also perform what's called a volume scan, which instead of just a one line, a whole scan of volume is taken, and this can be presented as a movie just kind of flowing right through here in cross-section, and it's possible then to easily, the computer can calculate the, the actual amount of volume or can measure the actual thickness in a given site. As the patient comes for follow-up, the scan is repeated. Again, it's a non-invasive there's no angiography involved. There's just photography uh, along with OCT. We can show the patient that the thickness is getting better, or we can make a different intervention if the thickness is not resolving. So uh, exam to exam is very precise because, again, of eye tracking and registration. That's part of the spectralis unit. Another case typical uh, thing that may happen in clinic, patient complaining of a, a vague change in her vision, comes in, has a poor endpoint manifest, can't really, you know, tell you which is better, one or two. The tear film and the media look clear. And on clinical exam, the macula looks pretty close to normal. With multimodality imaging, it can be seen, however, that there's a lamellar hole. So this is one of those things that is difficult to see clinically. But when you apply OCT, it's quite evident what the pathology is. So there doesn't need to be a lot of wasting of time, scratching of heads, um, re-refracting, doing visual fields, 
it really shows you what's going on. This is just a more involved macular hole to show you the spectrum of it. Uh, but it's a it's just another another way to show what an exquisite tool this is for showing this kind of pathology. Another case to talk about would be a patient who complains of visual distortion, uh, unable to uh, be refined very well on manifest refraction, and having an abnormal antler grid. Well, this patient, the question might be, is this a new onset of AMD? Um, could this be an epiretinal membrane? When you look at this patient, clinically, it, it is evident that there is wrinkling. And this can show you, in cross-section, the degree of wrinkling. And also, it's very suggestive that this is, would be amenable to membrane peeling, because there is a very, very discrete surface membrane. So that could be a consideration in helping know that there may be some benefit from intervention, specifically peeling and a referral to retina. So it helps cut to the chase and helps make a, re a referral that's appropriate and, a, uh, in this case, a referral that's very refined diagnostically. Uh, another case that may present itself during the course of your day would be a 35-year-old female who acutely recognizes some loss of vision in the right eye, really uncertain as to when it started, um, just knows that it's not right now. And in manifest, there's a hyperopic shift in her best to correct acuity is 2040. Well, the clinical exam looked fairly normal with maybe a loss of red reflex. But when you see the OCT in cross-section, it's very obvious that this is a, a it is central serous corneal retinopathy. So without angiography, there's no question that you can see the nature of the pathology. You can see an, an, an elevation here, Brooks membrane, and there is central serous corneal retinopathy. So this patient is somebody who could be followed and usually would be followed and expected to have some resolution. Now, we do know, uh, we typically expect uh, CSR to resolve without much residua. However, there are cases, and this is again a great example where we apply the multimodality imaging when a cross section is shown through uh, prolonged CSR, that there's an area where you have photoreceptor dropout, which you can see here. Right here, you can see the line of photoreceptors. All of a sudden, the photoreceptors are missing, and that correlates to this area here. So you can expect subtle, permanent, central defects in someone who has had prolonged CSR. So this tool really helps you identify CSR, follow the progress, and identify people who don't progress and may require some intervention. Um, this case is another common presentation in a day of a clinician. 78-year-old woman, she's known to have dry AMD. She's been seen before, and she she uses her Ambler grid at home. It's on her refrigerator. She knows to put her glasses on and check herself with her Ambler one eye at a time from 40 centimeters away. And she's noted a subtle change. She's a good good observer, and she comes in because we've instructed her to come in if she notices any change. And of course, I would be concerned that this might be a conversion to the wet form of AMD. And sure enough, uh, clinically, it doesn't look like much. There wasn't any blood. But when we see in OCT cross-section, there is a break in Brooks membrane. And there is some involvement in the submacular area. So this patient needs a very prompt referral to retina. And in the past, of course, we knew that patients like this, the best thing we could do for them is keep them from getting worse slower than they might otherwise. Now, of course, with uh, anti-VEGF treatment, we can expect to see patients like this actually improve. So with a tool that can detect such subtleties, we can intervene early and expect to really be someone who can help maintain and regain vision in macular disease. So in summary, just point out that OCT, the multimodality imaging, including autofluorescence, gives high-resolution images of the fundus 
and high resolution cross sections of the macula areas of, that, of the retina that you might be concerned about. The blue peak, which is a blue laser autofluorescence, really helps delineate the dry A and D changes very precisely, and it can follow them over time. So it can prognosticate, and sometimes it can provide reassurance that things aren't changing from time to time, which can be helpful to people and helpful to patients in their outlook. Uh, it detects the important findings uh, that can happen very often without the need for FA. It doesn't completely obviate the need for FA in some cases, uh, but it, it certainly is usable in the comprehensive ophthalmology setting without having to set up a laser suite, and a large, large percentage of things can be elucidated without having to utilize angiography to uh, detect them. Very helpful, very important is the circle scan around the optic nerve to address the status of glaucoma, whether it be diagnosis or following a patient with known glaucoma to determine whether they may be progressing or whether they may be stable. And I would again emphasize that the eye tracking that is unique to this instrument allows for precise image capture and for the serial comparison that's so important to understanding what direction uh, patient's eye disease is taking. So an efficient diagnosis, that is being able to cut to the chase, what's going on, why is a patient not seeing as well, really helpful for AMD, epiretinal membranes, uh, certainly macular hole, detection of CSR, and glaucoma changes. Well, those things come up every day, and it is really nice to be able to make your clinic flow smoother by having exquisitely precise and well-defined images, and being able to go over these images with the patient. It also is very helpful to identify patients who are perhaps not such good candidates for multifocal IOLs in order to uh, avoid uh, the disappointment of an outcome that's suboptimal. And it's also very nice to be reassured that, hey, everything is great in the macula. This patient ought to be able to see well after multifocal IOL and the patient can feel confident about making that choice with their disposable income. And it does generate uh, revenue in that there are many indications for utilizing multimodality imaging as recognized by uh, uh, Medicare and many insurances. So at this point, I'm uh, glad I was able to go through those examples, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions to discuss spectralis and multimodality imaging. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Ulrich, for that wonderful presentation. You're welcome. And we'll go ahead and open the floor for our question and answer session. You can either click the Q&A button at the top of the participant list, or you can send a chat message. And we'll go ahead and begin. We have our first question. If one can detect subtle anatomic changes in the nerve fiber layer of glaucoma patients, can we now abandon visual field testing for most patients? Well, that is a very good question. I, uh, I have to say, you know, we historically, glaucoma has been a disease that we've sort of crept up on, on our understanding of it. And we certainly don't have a full understanding of what glaucoma is. In fact, glaucoma may be many things. You know, in different people, uh, it may manifest differently. But the, but the hallmark of it in most cases is loss of nerve fiber layer early in the course of disease. So it may be that we've used visual fields uh, to define glaucoma. Many studies use that as an outcome measure. You know, you, you look at anatomy and can predict, uh, such as in the OAT study, uh, of which patients may progress to visual field loss. So. We're still using visual field as a means of identifying and calling a disease. So as time goes on, we may refine our means of, of calling glaucoma what it is by switching over and talking more anatomically than physiologically. But um, at this point, I don't think people are rushing away from visual field testing, but it's nice that you can have another tool other than visual field testing to hang your hat on 
Um, certainly there's so many visual fields that come up equivocal, and that's one time that the anatomic uh, evaluation is really nice is to either correlate with uh, questionable visual, visual field loss or maybe reassure yourself that that visual field loss is really, there's no anatomic correlation with it and it's not physiologic. So I, to answer the question, I don't think at this time we're going to abandon visual field testing because it's an adjunct and we know that there are stages of glaucoma where visual field testing may be more helpful, particularly late stage. Um, so it will remain part I think, of, of testing, although that's a whole subject of itself, uh, how refined and how much better we can do with visual field testing than what we currently do. Excellent. And another question. In your opinion, does autofluorescence allow you to hold on to your patients longer since it's mainly used for monitoring AMD, or are you still referring these patients immediately to a retina specialist? Well, I, it would depend on your... Uh, on your comfort level, I, I certainly would say that auto, that autofluorescence allows you to identify AMD in the early stages. And at this point, other than late stage dry AMD, we don't really have any proven treatments for AMD. Uh, other, of course, other than wet AMD. For dry AMD is what I'm talking about. So I think you could confidently hold on to these patients and, and you don't need to refer them out to retina. And it allows you to know the point at which they need to go to retina. Now you may not, if you, if, if you as a clinician are not comfortable with discussing the, the nuances such as, gee, you, they, people want to know should I be taking multivitamins? And if you're, if you're familiar with the studies and what the studies show, you can advise patients that, well, in the mild forms, we haven't shown a benefit. Uh, nevertheless, there may not be a downside to using vitamins. Um, that may be an appropriate thing to do, and holding on to such a patient would probably be appropriate. Um, but I think very specifically, you see somebody who's developing uh, a subretinal uh, neovascular membrane, that patient would be referred. But for the most part, uh, where retina intervention is not required, I think you could hold on to these people and follow them. All right, and another question. How frequently do you obtain circle scans in glaucoma patients? Every one year or every six months? That's a great question, too. I think there's, in general, once a year uh, would be probably a minimal amount. Uh, we, we know glaucoma changes slowly. If I had a patient who I was very concerned about. In fact, I could give an example. I have a 39-year-old patient who has a family history of glaucoma who has corneas that uh, are in the range of 400 microns of central thickness, who has a very significant amount of cupping in the right eye, and uh, who, um, you know, they, they have a long time in their life to lose ground. I image that patient every six months because you know, she's, she's young, and I want to make sure I know what's going on, and if I need to step up therapy, I don't want to lose an extra six months of ground. So it might depend on the age of the patient, and it might depend on the severity of their glaucoma. So I would say the, group, the more severity would be maybe more toward the, every six months, and more uh, healthy, I would say, more toward a year. All right. And we have a, a lot of questions coming in. That's excellent. So okay, I'll, is try having, re, I'll try to give succinct answers. <laughs> is having the normative database important for the macula, optic nerve head, and retinal nerve fiber layer? And does spectralis have this? Well, normative, well, spectralis at this time does not have a normative database. However, my understanding is that they have submitted uh, a request for that to FDA because these instruments are uh, cleared, uh, I think normative databases are cleared by FDA uh, separately from the instrument itself. The instrument is FDA cleared. Normative databases are not cleared. What normative databases do, of course, is allow you to compare people to their age-matched norms 
and would help in the initial diagnosis. Uh, and and it, it would it gives you this statistical probability that something may or may not be related to glaucoma. So I think normative databases are helpful in the initial assessment. But uh, when you talk about um, when you talk about glaucoma, so much of it has to do with comparing the patient to their own baseline. That once identified, the normative database is much less relevant. Uh, than it is on initial diagnosis. As far as normatives uh, for macula, um, that is also something that's relevant. You certainly have the index eye to compare to um, that to, to to the normal eye, so you can see what kind of differences there may be there too. And so, developing normative databases is an important feature. And and my understanding is this is something that uh, that is being worked uh, toward so that could be added to spectralis. And how would I know if a tech misses a small lesion on a linear scan, for example, the small macular hole that you showed? Can I look through scans in, in the lane versus having to take the patient back to the OCT to re-examine? Absolutely. Uh, you don't actually obtain just one line scan. Uh, it actually scans a 30-degree um, area. And I just happened to show one line there just for example, but you can place the cursor anywhere there. Um, spectralis is configurable in a network setting, so, so if, you, if you're networked, you can certainly look at this at the computer screen in your lane, and you can manipulate this in the computer screen in your lane. So you can just scan across any of that 30 degrees and select the section that you want to look at. And if one can detect subtle anatomic changes in the nerve fiber layer of glaucoma patients, can we now abandon visual field testing for most patients? I think we identify. I think we've we've addressed that question. And, and in a word, it was. I don't think we can abandon it. It's an an adjunct to um, understanding the optic nerve is not only its anatomy but its function. But uh, the anatomy is playing a, b a bigger and bigger role in diagnosis and management as time goes on as we have better tools to actually precisely measure it and to be confident that we're measuring the same area each time. Thank you. That did come in twice. And when would you use well, we, we answered the question. We just, it's good to answer it because there's two yes, eyes. So we can answer one, for each, one question for each eye. When would you use SA instead of OCT? Well, FA would be useful if one were planning treatments, perhaps focal treatment. Focal treatment for and a good example would be focal uh, diabetic macular edema. Uh, uh, that so that so that the retina specialist in the, in that case might use FA as an adjunct to guide areas of treatment. Um, there are some other you know diseases that are better displayed that are, may not be represented by RPE dropout and maybe represented more by vascular changes. And so those diseases that are not so common in, in comprehensive practice but are more common in retina practice, um, FA would be more applicable. All right. Just a couple more. What is the impact of media opacities on the quality of the OCT image? Well, I'm happy to say that's one of the very big upsides. Of, uh, of imaging is that the media does not have to be very clear. As a matter of fact, I showed the example in the cataract patient. That's precisely one of the um, helpful aspects of it. We have patients who have less than clear media, and it in inhibits you as an examiner from seeing, you know, some of the subtle details in the macula that clue you into what's exactly going on, such as the vitreo macular traction or the lamellar hole. So without good media, you can still get images because the, uh, the, the, the uh, infrared as well as the uh, OCT will penetrate. All right. Are we able to evaluate the ganglion cell layer in glaucoma? Well, the ultra-high resolution, we can see ganglion cell layer. We've sort of come to it a discussion of what we call the 
uh, retinal nerve fiber layer complex, which consists of the nerve fiber layer, which is defined here, and then the ganglion cell layer, which is this darker stripe here. So it is definable, but since the nerve fibers emanate from the ganglion cells, they're part and parcel of the same complex, um, you know, that's transmitting uh, visual information from the surface or from, from the retina to through the optic nerve head to the lateral geniculate body. All right, and we got another good question. You stated the benefit of identifying pathology in patient selection for premium IOLs, but do you recommend OCT as part of the preoperative assessment for all cataract patients? Well, I think all cataract patients in whom who are who are contemplating having a premium IOL, at least in my experience, I think it is very helpful. Um, it helps to counsel the patient because normally, even in, in any cataract surgery, we really do want to know the the potential vision that the patient may have, whether there are any limitations, and in particular, because of the the optics of uh, multifocal lenses or refractive lenses, we really want to know in particular in their cases that their that their uh, macula is intact. So, to answer your question. I think it is something that you want to do in people who are preoperative uh, candidates for multifocal IOLs and who are contemplating spending the money for a multifocal IOL. All right. How much does a role of the technician have on the accuracy of the OCT results? Or because of the eye tracking, is it not important? Well, uh, it, the answer is the technician is important because the technician obtains the scan. Uh, a, a clinician can use this as well. It could obtain the scan. Uh, but it makes the eye tracking makes the job of the techni technician much easier uh, so that, as we all know, patients are somewhat, sometimes more attentive, sometimes less attentive. Uh, but if the machine itself is following any little movements, it really does the work. Uh, so the technician needs to line it up, uh, just get it registered, and then spectralis will continue the scan, and so it does make it easier for the technician. So it, it's a combination of the technician's skill, and it just uh, is less onerous of a task each time for the technician. All right. And do all spectralis OCT machines have Blue Peak laser autofluorescence option? No, uh, that's uh, the the come in five modes, and the three mode machine is the one that has infrared, OCT, and autofluorescent. That's three mode. Uh, the uh, other modes are fluorescein angiography and ICG. All right, and. One final question. Do you consider it useful to use OCT to follow up patients with radiation retinopathy? Well, radiation retinopathy, uh, of course, will display itself usually in the form of um, neovascularization. And so probably uh, clinical examination is the most helpful. This also is sometimes done peripherally, and I'll tell you one thing about OCT or, or about spectralis. There is a mode uh, that can be mounted on a pivot so that imaging can be done peripherally as well. So you could use the IR mode to look at and look for, but if there were any questions, uh, it would be appropriate to use angiography. But again, the angiography can be done, uh, the instrument can be tilted, and things can be visualized, visualized peripherally as well. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Ulrich, for that excellent presentation. You're welcome. And on behalf of all of us here at Heidelberg Engineering, I'm Eva Kroniker. And if you would, please take a moment to fill out the evaluation that you'll see when you exit your WebEx session. That just helps us with future courses. And if you have anything that you'd like to see presented in any of our future courses, please let me know, and we'll be sure to include it in our next discussion forum. 
And with that, for those of you on the East Coast and in the Midwest, have a wonderful evening. And for those of you here on the West Coast, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And to all of you, thank you again for joining the Heidelberg Engineering Academy.